They tied me so hard that the flesh cut open. She's a tool, she's a channel, she's a platform. She becomes a means through which actually conflict can be fought. Uganda lies at the heart of the African continent covering about 26,000 square kilometers of land and water. The startling beauty of this East African country is attributed to one of the most unique climatic conditions in the world. But Uganda is not only richly endowed with a wonderful weather pattern. It has diverse linguistic and ethnic groups of people that were geographically bound and granted political independence in 1962 by the British colonial government. This is a young nation with young political institutions and you find that because there are no civil institutions uh, to bring about law and order, there is a tendency for anarchy. Even the post-colonial governments have done little to unite the Ugandans. If anything, the politicians, the, the post-colonial state has taken advantage of uh, these ethnic differences and religious differences and regional differences to magnify them for its own survival. And this is particularly so in terms of political intolerance. Many Ugandan scholars believe that the colonial masters did not do enough to cohesively bring the various ethnic groups together. Although this couldn't have been the only factor for creating conflict, it was a critical recipe for the basis of turmoil in the country. Geopolitically, it is in the heart of Africa. So there are various forces which have been wanting to take over Uganda in order to advance their regional interests. Take, for example, Islamic fundamentalism in the Sudan, then there is America wanting to have influence from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. And you have got uh, the Christians also wanting to roll back is Islam. And some of these global forces, plus of course the East-West conflict, have had their share of confusing Ugandans and they have gone to war. The UPC government of 1962 could not help falling victim to political intolerance and therefore laid the foundation for such anarchy in the mid-60s. In January of 1971, Uganda was set for a bloody experience in military dictatorship when Idi Amin toppled the UPC government through a coup d'etat. Following the removal of Idi Amin in 1979, post-independence Uganda held the second general elections ever in 1980. These elections are said to have been massively rigged. Presidents have been coming to power mainly by the gun. I also came by the gun, you remember? Yoweri Museveni, one of the then contestants for the presidency, declared a people's protracted war. Once you talk about armed conflict, you inevitably have uh, humanitarian issues. Now, under, uh, under the rules of uh, of war, there are rules to war. So in fact, in, in theory, uh, wars can be fought a, in a humane way with uh, maximum respect to human rights. But as we all know, most of the conflicts, particularly the civil wars in, in the Great Lakes region and Uganda have been fought in almost complete disregard of uh, the laws uh, of, of humanitarianism. And therefore, you find that civilians are seen as legitimate targets. Legitimate enough to usher in a new phenomenon in the history of Uganda, internally displaced persons. The massive social dislocation of people has since become a regular pattern of Uganda's social reality. Today, Uganda is riddled with campsites, in some places camp villages, especially in the troubled areas of Western, north and northeastern sub-regions. 
Prior to these was the West Nile conflict northwest of the country. About 51% of the entire population of Uganda are women. And in areas of armed conflict, the proportion of women is even higher because the men usually either go under or if they don't go under, they are joining the armed forces themselves. But until recently, little was known about the experiences of Uganda's women in situations of armed conflict. I heard the echoes all around the world, and I saw the women with tears, weeping, crying for peace, help, with no one to listen. We hear about so many male heroes, but we have never heard about the women silent sufferers. And of course this has continued affecting women to an extent that they have lost their self-esteem. The starting point for these silent sufferers in regaining their self-esteem is breaking the cord of silence. At ISIS Women's International Cross-Cultural Exchange, the drive for the need to know more about the plight of women in situations of armed conflict became the motivating factor. Working with the rural women and community-based organizations during their research and documentation activities in different parts of the country, ISIS Wiki was able to identify the women's problems and needs, organize short-term interventions on location, and launch long-term advocacy campaigns against the perpetuation of armed conflict. Some women were able to share the experiences in focused group discussions within their localities, while others could open up only in confidence. These women had never spoken to anybody about their experiences of war. So asking them to give their experience was like opening up a can of worms. We were told that the war would last only three days but by this time, there was nothing more to eat, not even a single leaf, with no shelter, and the children already falling sick. Life was at its worst. And for five years, the women and children of Luero trotted the bushes of what came to be popularly known in the early 80s as the Luero Triangle. Here, the women and children can be seen demonstrating for camera a survival mechanism. So now the woman is now being again crowned with the mantle of protector over the rest of the people that she has been left behind with. She herself is vulnerable because they want to rape her or they want to torture her. Their vulnerability now even more eminent. Sharing their ordeals more than a decade away seemed like just the day before. Their memories still as fresh. My husband had been killed and my co-wife abducted. A couple of days later, the same men returned and demanded for one of the three-year-old children, saying that the mother had asked for the child. They harassed and abused me sexually. I continued suffering with the remaining children, using dry banana leaves for a blanket. I remember one Sunday, a soldier hit my head with a gun muzzle as they interrogated me. I picked a leaf to wipe off the blood, but the soldier continued beating me. At dawn, we were always on the alert, ready to take off again. We had become soldiers of sorts. Everybody knew what to do. Everybody had something to carry, ranging from a kettle to anything we had taken with us. I was pregnant and had a successful delivery. But my husband and I were so worried for the baby under the circumstances, and my condition was not good. There was no food to eat, and I had to breastfeed. We had to make a very painful decision to terminate the baby's life. Because society constructs this woman as property, as an, uh, something that is owned by her spouse, if the fighting forces or the belligerents hit out at this platform, this precious property, then they are actually achieving the ultimate aim. 
Cecilia and her mother were among a group of women and children who were forcefully camped by the then government soldiers near a detach. She was routinely stalked by the soldiers at dusk and gang raped all night long. At nightfall, I had to hide myself, sometimes amidst the crowd of people, and they would have to cover me up in an attempt to save me from the soldiers. They then demanded from me, where is Cecilia? My mother was then tortured until she released me. I was whisked away and gang raped until dawn. Time came when I was unable to have short or long calls. I had severe abdominal pains and swelling, and since then I have continuously lived past. Because of poor income, I have not had proper treatment. In spite of her problem, Cecilia married after the war and lives today with a family of six children. Some of them suffered from injuries to their birth canals, injuries to their bladders, which are still going on. And as a result of being exposed to rape and indiscriminate sex, sexually transmitted diseases uh, are common. In the north of the country, the situation for women was not any better. They suffered at the hands of both rebels and government soldiers. In the protected camp, women are picked by the so-called protectors at will and sexually abused. This man is a camp dweller who witnessed a neighbor being dragged by a government soldier. It happened recently over there. The other day, another woman was grabbed from that hut. It is very common. Florence nearly lost her husband one night when a government soldier came to their home alleging her husband to be a rebel. Florence's husband got away after a brief scuffle. For this soldier, it was however not obvious to go after the rebel suspect, but a now vulnerable Florence. The man forced himself on me for several hours into the night. I then realized that he was in a deep sleep. I carried the youngest child on my back, picked the other two and left the house. Only a short distance away, I decided to go back and pick his gun. I delivered it to the area local authority where I reported the matter. They rushed and arrested him. In the morning, he was then taken to the nearest army detach. For several months, Florence and her relatives followed up the matter, only to learn later on that the man had been redeployed. Um, they could go to the police, but the, the relationship between the police and the army does not usually allow for easy investigation. So, so, uh, so this woman sadly runs into institutional problems, which, yes, she might get success for an individual case, but unless you address the problems within those institutions so that they have uh, no tolerance uh, for abusers of rights within their ranks, you will always have those problems. The Lord's Resistance Army Insurgency in northern Uganda is notorious for the abduction of children. Girls are forced into marriage, boys forcefully conscripted into the rebel ranks and coerced into performing some of the most gruesome acts of torture, many times against their own relatives. They made us to contribute in the killing of this girl. They didn't want to waste their bullets, but they told us to, to get things like firewood, anything which can be able to kill her. So the third of us were called and they told us if you don't participate, we shall also do it to you instead. So we were forced to beat this girl while she was not yet dead really, as in dead. Then they came and finished her. Gulu Support the Children Organization in Gulu Town is a center for the rehabilitation of repatriated and traumatized children. 
This one has been recently operated. At the center, the children undergo therapy and counseling before they can return to normal public life. We believe there is a little goodness, there is a little strength left in the child. Yeah. So our approach is to build from that little strength the child yeah. has. No see him as a person, no matter whatever he has done. These drawings were made by the children. They depict the nature and extent of trauma the children have experienced. The multi-generational transmission of trauma is the tendency to build up prejudice. Never to trust the person next door who may look different from you, who may speak a different language or have a different culture. And that perpetuates discriminatory practices and disrespect for human rights which even in the long run perpetuates violence in societies at a psychological level. The persistent cycle of conflict in Uganda has increased the availability and proliferation of small arms in the hands of different fighting groups. This is particularly true with the people of northeastern Uganda. In another form of armed conflict, what used to be an inter-tribal struggle for animal wealth among the Karimojong and Itesot of northeastern Uganda has now graduated into an armed aggression by the Karimojong with the acquisition of guns. This was further intensified by the insurgency by a rebel group that was also active in the area, the Uganda People's Army. Again, the women the ultimate victims. During the time of the insurgency and when these Karamajongs attack, as much as 35 out of every 40 girls get raped. So the fear of rape, which we saw is at 66%, is a real fear because it's arising out of their experience. This is my son, the whole village refers to him as the son of infidels. This boy is to the villagers a symbol of terror and himself traumatized at a very tender age. He will never live a normal life because he's been rejected by society. Maria's pains are a lifetime's. 